I don't think it will uh, stay as is right now. And we are reviving. We are, we are basically Dr. Frankenstein's. Yeah. We are reviving the, you know, that duck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's it's exactly alive. It. Yeah. It's alive. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Quackcast. This is Quackcast number 387. I'm Ozone Ocean and with me is Tarns. Hi Tarns. Hello. And this week we're going to be talking about uh, historical setting, the what it takes to to do a historical kind of war story, basically from uh, two perspectives. So I'm doing PQTA, which is alternate history, set in the 1920s, and you're doing um, without moonlight and brave resistance, so the 1940s, real 1940s. 90, yes, we don't um, uh, deviate from history. Yeah, so you've got no, like, people in arseless army pants walking around or helicopters or any no any fun <laughs> stuff. Jet-powered flamethrowers no, no, don't no make an stuff. appearance. <laughs> no. no fun stuff. Damn everybody it. is grim and sad and, and angry. Everybody. <laughs> need more Mecca in that story. So... <laughs> Yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about, uh, what it takes to do a, a historical setting. But before we get into that, I've got to mention the feature, and uh, the feature is something I did this week. So here I am talking about the featured comic. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ozan Ocean, and my feature for the week was Quixote Coyote. Quixote Coyote is a plucky little chap. He's almost unstoppable and certainly very likable. He lives up to his namesake, the famous Don Quixote. He's ready to stand up for the weak and follow causes for his own chaotic reasons. Or should I say chaotic reasons? <laughs> or quixotic, which is the silly way uh, we pronounce it in English. Anyway, he's getting into adventures all the time and scrapes just for the fun of it. You could almost call him ca- chaotic coyote. <laughs> Just remember to pronounce his name right, Quixote. So Quixote Coyote is an anthro coyote who lives in a little town full of cute little anthro characters and some not so cute, like the weasels and the wolves. So very much like uh, Wind in the Willows where the uh, the baddies were sort of, uh, wolves, uh, well, weasels. <laughs> anyway, um, just watch how... Quixote Coyote deals with them. This is a humor comic strip. All the art is it black and white line art. It's comically stylized and very pro looking. And what I mean by pro looking is it's very clean line art and the characters are very regularly drawn. So um, the artist, which is uh, C Joe 1377, is very good at repeating his artwork or her artwork, sorry. Um, Cjo one three seven seven is very good at repeating their artwork, so um, it's always looks good, and it's complements the writing perfectly. It's a very amusing comic. I definitely recommend it. Which we, you know, that's no surprise because it's a feature, which is literally me recommending it. Um, it's rated. E for everyone, so uh, read it. And that was the featured comic. Okay, now next up we have the featured music from Gumwalis. So here we go with the featured music. And this week Gumwalis has given us the theme to It's Permanent. This is old school southern rock. Laconic, melodic, hard drinking, late night whiskey beer and cigarettes. Play your cards right and you'll be going home with the prettiest cowgirl. Take it away, Gumwallis, with It's Permanent.
Gun Wallace's music. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Gun Wallace. Okay, history, war history, all that kind of stuff. How do you approach? I mean, you approach it like you said, not doing alternative stuff. But how do you sort of make everything look like it's from the past, authentically? Mm, okay. Oh, well, the first of e, the first thing that you absolutely need to do is to have all the setting right. Costumes have to be accurate. Um, as much of the setting has to be accurate for the times, like uh, it has to be 1940s Athens as much as yeah. possible, uh, rather than uh, 2018 Athens. Um, so that uh, that is uh, something that when you can't get like when I can't get it and uh, there are a lot of occasions I have to sort of wing it in a way that would be plausible for that time like what would exist there in uh, the areas where now you have big um, glass buildings and, and mm-hmm. things that wouldn't exist back then, uh, you need to either find a photograph of the time of the area and see more or less how it was, or you have to imagine how it would be. So would you have like a pastiche of a 1940s building and you're just like, okay, this if, if I'm going to make this look like 1940s, that building is going to have to have domes and arches and stonework. Yes. And that's yeah. just what I'm going to do. The, the good thing about it is that uh, the, the, the area where most of the action is taking place right now um, is pretty much unchanged currently as it was back then because it's the historical center and it was as it is now. So yeah. I went there and I got like a gazillion pictures from all the streets where I know the action is taking place. And I just need to look at those and and uh, yeah. paint the houses in the colors that they would have then because yeah okay now they have all this very pretty yellow uh, yellow crisp white uh, coats of yeah. paint over they didn't back then but that's pretty much it in other areas like suburbs. And like um, when you go away, still in the center of Athens, but away from the city center, the historical center, uh, then you have to definitely look for pictures of the era, because if you don't, at least the Greek audience is going to realize that you haven't done your homework, because uh, certain areas like uh, certain squares uh, have gotten different iterations and different looks per decade. So they are like placeholders for history. If you don't draw them as they were, it will look bad on anyone who has knowledge of that. Okay. So, yeah, that's how... And, and then I also use a very desaturated palette, color palette, but I also do that for mood because I want everything to feel drab and heavy and since so there's that. Yeah, they were into those colours too back in the nineteen forties. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just that the film stock is faded and looking drab. They did actually it was popular to like those colours back then for some reason. Mm-hmm. So yeah that Yeah, they definitely like that. <laughs> that that's a big factor. Um, what you said about, say, the, well, what I said and put it, the words into your mouth about the uh, the pastiche of the buildings, in Pinky TA, as, you know, that's more a, um, a, like you say, an alternative history. So it's sort of set in the 1920s and I sort of make it up as I go along and it's sort of like I make things look as if they're in the 1920s rather than basing it on. Mm-hmm. Real buildings because it's a 
you know the Crimean Empire is a fictional empire but I I find it quite interesting when I was like uh in the latest story of Pinky TA I've got this um whole workshop and all this kind of stuff in the snow where Pinky and her group are making these mecha so I've got these uh huge warehouses and they you know you have to look at okay in the 1920s what did warehouses look like Mm -hmm. and these barracks that these people are in what did those buildings sort of look like and you sort of do a, a pastiche of the way they used to make things rather than actually you know doing their whole Miyazaki thing and basing stuff on actual you know he he does fantasy um history or thing things that are set in history but you know um like fantasy yeah. but he bases them on actual real things you know maybe in Porco Rosso or something like that or um Spirited Away with the Spirit Town and I don't know Hell's Moving Castle so he actually bases yeah. those things on actual real things so whereas when I'm doing it I'm basing it on like on a, on a made up sort of thing which is a bit harder yeah so I'm way more skilled than Miyazaki no I'm not saying that at all <laughs> <laughs> that's just my lazy way of doing it which is actually a rather stupid thing to do you should do the Miyazaki approach it's it's a lot more well, intelligent I, actually I, I don't uh, I don't think you should characterize your method that way because it does feel authentic enough authentic enough I and mean, I think that's a very good rule of thumb um, it feels like it comes from a era that had the 1920s approach, even though, like, uh, even though they have the mecca and everything, it feels old. Okay. Like it's, it's, uh, it's from an, another era, yeah. historically, and and uh, you do have enough research in how the in the logic of how they constructed their buildings and how they approach technology in how they approach um, costumes and uniforms and things like that. And that gives the feeling and the sensation of the 20s. Definitely feels like the 20s. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad it's... It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... it's very hard when you when you kind of get into it and sort of logic reason it out because it's there's mental gymnastics because these things don't exist and but how would they have if they had and so then mm -hmm. you have to think you know, how f if i'm going to modernize aspects of the 1920s how far do i take that do i you know add computers do i add the whole you know um 19 like in the 1980s the idea of uh futurism was to have everything white and clean and um, mm. modernized, you know, basically based on like uh, Star Wars and 2001 A Space Odyssey, Star mm -hmm. Trek, all that kind of stuff. That's how they do it. Jumpsuits everywhere. Yeah, jumpsuits, exactly. So, yeah, how how far do I modernize it? And I have modernized it a little bit. You know, people wear so sort of like skin tight sort of tops with a zip at their throat and things like that. And and so it's um it's very much a, um like a a tug of war between modernizing it and also making it sort of old fashioned and how mm -hmm. far do we go? And it's an interesting process, but the big benefit of having something said in the past is you've got all this wealth of history and artwork to draw from. So if I want to give picky address, then I just look at like stuff that's in the past. If I want to do interesting things, with the uniforms I look at old fashioned uniforms and get inspiration from that. Whereas if you were doing something futuristic, then you have to be a lot more um, clever in, in the way you do that because then you have to think, okay, I have to make this look like it's something 50 years mm -hmm. from now and how would that be? And you have to do a lot more thinking about how to do that. So that's one of the benefits of sitting something in the past. You have Absolutely. To draw from. And bringing alive, bringing alive an, an era that already existed 
is, I think, assuming, of course, that you're doing it um, legitimately, like uh, you seriously do want to bring alive the era and, and give the audience the experience of being in that era, whether it is uh, parallel history or actual history, is a little bit, I think, more doable uh, to do it authentically than it would be to to jump 50 or 100 or even more, like a, a thousand years into the future, assuming that you also want to give the experience, the legit experience of being in the future rather than just being in the present but with jumpsuits. Um, <laughs> Which is a, a thing, like. Um, oh, yeah. That's how they do because, Doctor Who in the old days. <laughs> exactly, uh, like you have to think ahead and project how science is evolving to go there, and that's I think harder to do, yeah. and it requires a lot more studying than is required in order to bring back something that has already been. Yeah. Um, we have already experienced it's it's already in our collective unconscious so a lot of respect to people that have managed to do that there are not very many in my opinion mm -hmm. but there are some who manage to think of an era that does feel like you are you know projecting and shooting off into the future oh, so yeah. that that is yeah that is quite a skill to have uh, Emma Claire does a bit of that in um, Constellation Chronicles. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's she's got that. And there, there have been some good comics on Drunk Duck that do that. Uh, ex, what was that one? Extinction or Extinct or Exterminate, something like that. But by U Udia, U Udia. Oh, oh yeah. I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I know who it is though. Exactly. Yeah, her name is um, Y U no U Y D E R. Anyway, mm. that's um, that's a really well done kind of thing. So there, that's futuristic. But yes, yeah, yeah, in yeah, it's it can be a tricky thing, especially say, well, yeah, as I said, I'm doing like an alternative history 1920s, and it has it's a world with Mecca, and mm -hmm. that changes the world a bit. So how far do you take that? And there's a gigantic tank thing in this comic as well. There's the the old judge helicopters in the very first part of the comic, but we we should mm -hmm. we never mention those again. We shall never speak of those. <laughs> <laughs> but how how far does that bleed in? How far does that uh, ruin the 1920s setting? How much future stuff can you stick in there? before you mess it up which is yeah that's tricky it's very tricky a balancing act i think i would say i would call it a, a balancing balancing act to be honest and one thing i'm curious about say in um in say your comic okay so i'll provide an example in mine so you're doing the you're doing the past setting and mm -hmm. like you do a say for example set dressing you're doing a room in in your comic and rooms have other features like light switches, light fittings, tables, um, dresses, chairs. Do you go mm -hmm. and look at those things and make them all like appropriate to the time? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the biggest uh, thing that jumps to mind in, the, in a situation like this is the medical, the medical stuff. The medical stuff. Oh yeah, with Nikos. In and, um, yeah, not only with Nikos, but also in, uh, like in without moonlight, even just an IV. The way the IV looks is uh, is entirely different to how it was back then. Yeah. To how it is now, and and although they did have it and uh, it was widely used and everything, so. Uh, you have to go look up 
and see how the IVs were not generally in the 40s because they also changed drastically over the decade. Yeah. So if you put like an anti-45 IV in 1942, someone is going to call it out. It's for sure. <laughs> like it will feel like an anachronism. Yeah, yeah, um, you got that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Pinky TA can get away with that in some respects. Yes, a little but bit you more. you can't. No, um, like for example, uh, in brave resistance, Nikos uses a siret, a morphine siret. Yeah. And and these things were strictly, or at least in my awareness, they were strictly field, like war field medicine. And and they had the, there was a very specific procedure in which they were used. Uh, Either the doctor would use it on the wounded soldier and then they would pin it on the soldier so that the other doctor, the surgeon that would receive uh, the injured uh, soldier when they were taken away from the battlefield uh, would know how much, the, um, how many spirits or when yeah. uh, they were administered. So, so they would give them an overdose. Yes, exactly. So I had to to tweak this for Nikos in the sense that he's not he's not in uh, the field the battlefield, but he is using these things because they are basically stolen from raids from crates of medicine intended for Rome, yeah, and not for Nikos. <laughs> <laughs> so. They would be like uh, military things, military issue things like this. And uh, so I had to find cigarettes and I had to go look for morphine cigarettes that were Nazi morphine cigarettes. There's also that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because they had different formats than the Allies in se several things. But you can't always find it. And when you can't find it, you have to wing it and pray that it falls at least uh, close to what there existed in reality. Yeah, um, I've had that. Yeah. But uh, the thing is that for very specific things that date the era and date, and then they will date your comic on whether it is accurate or not, you have to be extremely fastidious. Mm. And um, that is an exercise in uh, in frustration, always, often. <laughs> I've had to do that. Oh yeah, I've I've had that in in Pink ETA with um, you know, I'm depicting these scenes in the workshop, and I thought I've had to sort of brainstorm. Okay, so I'm doing a workshop scene. What do I need in a workshop scene? What, what do I have? Okay, so I need tools. I need um, drill presses. I need um, like cranes and things like that. I need blah, 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 blah. What did a drill press look like in the 1920s? I just mm. assume it'd be like a modern one. No, they're completely bloody different. And they were very, and they used exactly the same kind of drill press all the way until like the 19, 1950s or something like that. Lays mm. looked very different back then. All these kind of tools looked very specific. And so I, I was like, you know, getting drowning in the the pit of reference and historical accuracy. Yeah. And then I realized, <laughs> hang on, I can use my alternative history stuff to make all de idealized versions of these things that an audience would, re would recognize because drill presses in the 920s just look like nothing that exists today. They look bizarre. No one will know mm -hmm. what it is. So it's counterproductive to be too historically correct mm -hmm. because it's I'm trying to do a recognisable workshop scene and it's not going to be recognisable as a workshop scene. <laughs> so in that kind of aspect, it helps mm -hmm. to add anachronisms because I can, but it makes it more recognisable. So, yeah. Those I think that sometimes uh, anachronisms are necessary even when you are uh, reviving the actual historical time rather than uh, 
an alternate version exactly for that reason. Um, like for example, the, we, we have certain ways of communicating like body language and, and um, the ways that, like there is a, a social code that we have now that didn't exist back then. But if you go full for this and, and use the full body language and the full social code that the forties had, it's going to be too alien yeah. for the audience. They are not going they are going to misconstrue certain things um, and take it like for example, oh they they are they are not they are they are being uh, very typical where in fact they are flirting or they are being uh, prudes where in fact that was just the the language and the way they were talking not really how they felt but um, you can't like put asterisks in the balloons and say you know actually way that uh, 40s was and not uh, to be taken <laughs> in this and this and that and uh, because of course it will throw you out of the story so you have to tweak the, the, the dialogue and tweak some of the body language and the way that they interact with each other to signal certain things for a modern audience, which uh, wouldn't be the case in the 40s. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, an example I often bring up with people is um, when I was reading uh, Pride and Prejudice, I think it was, yeah, so the, the characters mention that they're making love with each other. And mm. yeah, in, in a context of books all the way up actually until the 1960s, I think it was making love meant courting and that's all it meant. The sexual mm -hmm. connotation was invented in the 1960s by basically stupid people who did not know what that meant. And they thought, well, let's just apply <laughs> this and you know, reinvent the term. And now it only means sex, but all, all throughout our history that that phrase was invented to mean courting. But if you have something set in the old days and you, you know, mention that phrase, a modern audience totally won't get that mm -hmm. because the meaning has changed. Even like gay, all, all exactly the way until like even the 1970s, gay meant happy and that was just what it was. But now it, it's totally shifted meaning. But mm -hmm. yeah, that that is a very recent kind of shift. So yeah, language like that can you have to really be aware of it. You have to have anachronisms like that. So you can't have people saying, "Oh, we're having a gay time," or "That's so, that's so gay," yeah. because it or or like different. if you have it like in a room full of men and they say we're having a gay time, <laughs> that's going to be... even if your audience understands that they are not uh, all being gay or something, um, it will still uh, ruin your mood, whatever your mood is, because it's going to get a chuckle at least yeah. out of the audience. And, and, and that might snap them out of, for example, yeah, the drama emotion. or suspense or whatever it is that you're going for. So that is definitely a thing. Yeah. Exactly. You have to really keep in mind those changing social um, factors relating to language and everything like that. That can mm -hmm. be really tricky. Um, yeah, in like for Picky TA, it's so much easier than what you have to do because I can incorporate anachronisms. Although, like, you know, we've said there's a balancing act, it makes it easier easier to include modern sensibilities mm -hmm. for my work like I can have ladies dressed in trousers and no one will comment whereas well in the 20s they did wear trousers they did but it was only in specific kind yeah. of yeah it wasn't just generally you couldn't just wear trousers whenever you wanted and, and in, then in very specific circles I suppose so there's also that Exactly. But I'm thinking that when you make uh, anything that is intended to have 
history in it in any way. There is a method that you go about it and, and you can't go off the deep end and drown in it until you learn to swim. Mm. But why do that when there is method? <laughs> and, and I think that the basic thing that one should do is narrow it down. Like, it's not the 40s. It's 1940 to 1942. This is your era. It's not the Middle Ages. It's a very specific time. And if you narrow it down enough, you will find that you have far less material to manage, at least in the beginning, and that you can navigate through and feel a little bit more in control of, in a sense. Okay. Um, why am I saying this? Because if you go too general, even if you begin very conscientiously, you know, doing your research and everything, it's going to be massive. The, the, the amount of data you have to sift through is massive. And even if it is uh, just in the in the order of uh, visuals. Yeah, if but you're if have you narrow it down, the history, that's... exactly. Uh, like I'm thinking, for example, if you go 1850s, if you go from 1850s fashion to 1860s, it changes drastically yeah. because it's a time where they were really evolving. It is, you know the society is pressing forward and, and so that everything else. So if you tell yourself, oh, okay, I'm going to, to pick my era to be the 1850s uh, and you jump in like this, you are going to be swamped because every year or so you have slight differences or big differences just in the, in the latest dresses that are going to drive you insane. <laughs> so you have to to narrow it down and then move gradually yeah, forward that, or backwards. That's a really good point because, you know, back then, okay, let's illustrate this for, for listeners as much as what I know. Okay, so in – people often look, okay, like the 19th century, everyone dressed like this. You know, women, women wore corsets, blah, 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 men did this. Okay, so that's bullshit. Back in, in like um, the early 1800s, women wore, had a very straight figure. Um, the dresses were very, very high on the chest and flowed back from there, um, low cut. And if you're going up to the 1850s, and then suddenly women have these enormous big wide dresses. And like, yeah. like they were back in the 1750s. So you've got these huge, you know, crinolines, Big, big white dresses, which is strikingly different to what, what they happened before and what happened after. It's a very bizarre kind of time in, in history in a lot of ways because then, then the hairs in ringlets, like very 19, uh, sorry, 17, <laughs> 17 <laughs> or whatever. So everything's like very retro there for some reason. And yeah, and that is very different to what was happening before and after and you've got to keep in mind that's a very um like unique time in history and it's it's not just a, you can't look at like then that time as being generalized can you you have to sort of get it no. right so yeah that's uh that's a very good point that so when i'm doing pinky ta and i'm sort of setting okay i'm setting this in the 1920s and i am being general but that's not because I'm taking all the 1920s and saying, okay, everything that happened in the 1920s is here. I'm, because mm -hmm. it's alternate history, I'm just taking, okay, I like this from the 20s, I like that for the 20s, and I like that. And I'm just picking mm -hmm. the things. Okay, I like these hairstyles, I like these coats, I like these dresses, you know, and those are the kind of things I like, uh, you know, those kind of uniforms or whatever. And I'm just cherry picking what I want. Because that's mm -hmm. the kind of work it is. It's not set in 1923. It's not set in 1925. It's just 20s themed. So I can do that. 
So yes. I'm allowed to do that. But for you, exactly. your stuff is set in during the Second World War, but it is like, you know, set in a specific year. Mm -hmm. so, like, for example, in, uh, in Brave Resistance, the, the planes that uh, are in the beginning that Hunter and his team fly and uh, they meet this uh, ignominious and um, that sets or starts of our adventure. Uh, they are technically not supposed to exist in 1943, until the very, very late 1943. Yeah. And even then, it's uh, really stretching it and pushing it. And, and the reason we picked the version of the Mustang, the P-51, if I'm not mistaken, because it's been a while since I researched that, um, uh, was because we wanted it to be very super advanced. Like, uh, it, I, we wanted it to feel that the, the actual plane that uh, the Americans are flying in for this particular mission were basically aberrations. They were not supposed to exist. They were yeah. prototypes, very advanced high -tech for the uh, super high technology. And and that actually is the, the point and the gist that drives not only this particular arc of brave resistance, but also the next one. Because as Hunter says, when uh, he discusses this with Nikos at some point, uh, it did feel and it was a trap. And someone sent them into this trap. And that's what is going to be explored in the second arc, after this arc ends, where we establish all our main characters. Um, okay. So there's so, that. So, yeah, in terms of that, instead of like saying, okay, so this is typical for 1941, so we can't have that, we can't have this. You're doing, you're going the other way slightly and you're saying, okay, this, this is not typical for 1941 and we know this and there's a reason for it. So yeah, you're putting that in there. But yeah. you, you are being a little anachronistic. I mean, no, I mean not really. Yeah. Because it well, is am... likely that that could have, that could have happened. That's not. An, a... It's not likely. It's, it's that logic says that it was in development enough at that yeah. particular point in time, which is uh, 1943 for Brave Resistance, that uh, that it could warrant to have prototypes. Yeah. Around. So, so if you play with the gray zone yeah. of plausibility in order to get the plot going. Yeah. It, it's plausible. Yeah. That's... Exactly. Which is why the planes are not uh, normal in any sense of the word, and we almost got our plot blown <laughs> wide open by connoisseurs. <laughs> of... <laughs> people in the know. Yeah, calling us out like this was the way it was done. It's like a, we know. Please don't <laughs> point it out exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be tricky. That could be very tricky. Yeah, so you don't actually. If you're doing something in the 1940s, you are ham hamstrung by that a bit because that history has happened. Mm -hmm. So you're and you're not the only ones who can research it and find out what happened. Other people can look at that history and know the circumstances. So they can predict things a bit and they can say, okay, yeah, that wasn't around, that that was around. And yeah, that that could be um, a bit of a rod for your back. Whereas yeah, absolutely. Me, I'm, I'm not so hum, hamstrung by that because yeah, mine is invented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, or, or if you do something like, uh, for example, if we take uh, Inglorious Bastards, you have Tarantino doing basically this, diverging from history. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we know that uh, Hitler was never in a, in a cinema and he didn't burn down <laughs> there. Spoiler, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
but uh, does matter because we all accept that this is an alternative version of history. So he does everything else in an accurate manner so that his fantastical story can, can fly on these wings and everything else will be quote-unquote forgiven. I, I, I'm not going to say that. Like It's going to be accepted. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of things in uh, Without Moonlight also, I hope, will work in that manner in the sense that I have kept things as historically accurate as I could make them at any given moment and I still keep researching and finding things and everything. But in order to get the story going, I have changed the story of what actually happened in Operation Harling to fit my plot, to yeah. to involve my characters in that particular plot. So I, I just created an accident that I hijacked from an actual accident that happened with a particular operation. So I have one of the uh, British SOE operatives fell uh, where they shouldn't mm -hmm. in reality, but I make made him fall really off <laughs> and land in Athens where he shouldn't uh, he shouldn't actually have been, um, and that's how we kick off the Without Moonlight plot. Okay. This is the thing that diverges from history enough to involve my characters in something that historically took place. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's pretty common when, you know, you look at Hollywood movies that were set in World War II. Yeah. Some of them were based on real events, but a lot of them are, are fiction. And you, you base it on, loosely base it on real stories that happened and you work your characters in around them. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you're not doing what people in the modern world do and like say okay this is how the americans found the enigma machine and you know oh no <laughs> rape history you're not doing that at all you're just sort of massaging a bit which is yeah, yeah way more interesting than reinventing stuff which is just, um that's I a bad way yeah, to do it, I think. yeah i think that reinventing stuff in, like twisting history completely out of shape in a way that doesn't signal to your audience that you're doing it because like if you do it like Tarantino everybody knows that this is an alternative yeah. history wish Nobody, that one. exactly Always. everybody wants to watch Hitler be pel pelted with I don't know how many hundred bullets uh, in a burning cinema so that's fine but if you present something as being historically accurate and then you swap events in a believable manner that someone who is not going to go look it up is going to take it as fact then that I think is uh, a transgression to your audience and to history yeah it's just yeah he just doing it bad <laughs> you're doing, it, you're doing yeah. a crap job and there's no Basically. reason to do that because there are established ways of, of doing these things that are way more interesting and way more fun like you're doing with them um, without moonlight mm -hmm. not only are you informing people of a, a hidden part of the history of world war ii you know with the jump the leapers and all that kind of stuff and the greek resistance which is people love resistance stories. You're also do, you're also creating an interesting story. So, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because the idea is to get people interested in the in the history and get them to research, and then when they do research, not to have them like completely be amazed. Oh my god. Everything I I saw or read was a lie. The idea is, oh, okay, this is what exactly, like, the accurate thing. And this is the inspiration of that film. Not that, oh, my God, I was lied to, like with uh, the Enigma machine 
and the Americans. No. <laughs> that, that's an affront. That's, that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a silly way of doing it. Whereas, yeah, uh, and uh, in, in Pinky TA, I totally um, just avoid all of that stuff and create whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, because because we when you have like a giant mecha in the in the twenties everybody knows what they are signing up for. So precisely. Oh and I can dump in I can do a Tarantino and dump in historical figures if I want. Mm-hmm. And yeah and and that. that I would be really interested if you do it. <laughs> because that would be a take, like an interpretation of these characters, these characters, these these figures' story, in a in a way that will be adapted for your world. And that will be very interesting, how that is and how that happens. Yeah, I will probably do that. I had, um, I I think I do have Mussolini in my comic somewhere. Mm. So is he is he a fascist yet? In your world, uh, I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I've I've got He's the not... because he started off being anti-war and all that jazz. So yeah. by yeah. the 1920s, I'm not sure what he was. He's sort of in the transition. I, I, I think he transitioned <laughs> during the decade, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So right, he got yeah. more more and more extreme. Where a lot of people did, you know, not many people started out as being bad people. Even Hitler didn't was always was a bit of a dick, but in World oh, no. War One he if wasn't he that always, much of a dick. If if you read his uh, biography, and I have read a couple of his biographies, because you know, know thy yeah. enemy, uh, you will see that he was generally a dick since. At least after World War One, if yeah. not during. But I mean, he so, was obviously the level of dickness that he became in the, uh, in the late thirties and uh, that kind of. Era. And that is what happens with enabling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, he sort of fell in with uh, the very a very very wrong crowd, and uh, they they all sort of uh, enabled each other and became far far worse than. What they would have you should been totally, you should totally have an incarcerated Hitler in your comic. <laughs> but during the time, he, I think he was in jail. So <laughs> get him in there. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Cool, because uh, Pinky G8, yeah, yeah it's set in alternative history. So there's the Crimean Empire. Um, so they're mainly Russian, these people, which are the Crimea. Mm-hmm. From what I've read was back in those days was more Russian than it was Ukrainian and that was just a, a bit of a weirdness of that uh, that part of the world and mm-hmm. it, it's changed hands in all sorts of weird ways at one time it was more Tatar than, than Ukrainian and Russian so you know so you've got those kind of uh, um, more tribal kind of people um, very very different from you know from the people that are now there now but at one time it was it was more Russian and that's sort of where the whole Pinky Tia world is where when it was Russian and uh, so the world is split in very different ways so it's sort of east and west in a lot of ways so the the Americans are more neutral in my world but they're more towards like supporting the the British kind of um, mm-hmm. empire of part of the world the British are sort of the bad guys in my comic, although I haven't really mentioned that yet. So, yeah, the <laughs> British Empire sort of bumps up against, like, the Crimean Empire as, you know, we're splitting off the world. And, yeah, then you've got, like, I'm not sure where, the like, the, the French and the Germans, again, so you've got all those kind of, like, semi-empires bumping up against each other. And I'm I'm thinking that the Crimean Empire is sort of you know at war with um, uh, the French and the English, pretty much. They're the main opponents, 
and mm. the Germans and the Italians. I'm not. I, I from uh, so far, I'm thinking they're sort of like uh, they could go either way. But they're sort of more neutral between the the Crimean Empire and the the other side, which is French and the English. Um, oh, that that's actually really, really exciting. Uh, if you go that way and you de demonstrate this, because that is a study in a sense in what might have been yeah. if uh, things were just slightly different, not even all that much. Well, in a lot of ways, it's sort of taking like the Crimean War and what happened then. So you have the back then you really did have like the French and the English against the Russians and. Mm -hmm. This is as if okay, the the Russians weren't really. I don't know. You know that that sort of ended a bit more inconclusively that whole period in history. Every everyone sort of yeah. lost, but in this version, yeah, the uh, the Russians are still very strong in that part of the world, and things are centered around Crimea. And mm -hmm. that way, I I can have all the interesting conflicts in Afghanistan. And you know uh, this Indian subcontinent between you know I can draw from history. So the British exactly. were very strong back then in those parts of the world, and yeah, the Americans were a, a growing power but neutral. They could be dangerous to everyone or no one, and so they're a, like you know a sleeping monster in the middle of the Pacific Atlantic, whatever. So yeah, I can I can use so many interesting aspects of history. Just interesting to me if I ever get up okay. to that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you will. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, awesome. And the, another thing, I think that someone, at least uh, in my experience, that uh, if you want to to get into history and to depict history, um, I think that is extremely important is to make sure that you get the stuff from a lot of sources and when I say a lot of sources I mean that you have to be extremely aware of the politics of the era even if you don't go for a political uh, slant in your comic even if you keep it absolutely like Indiana Jones level mm -hmm. uh, neutral to politics you still need to be extremely aware of the politics of the time because then you will be in command of the sources that you read mm -hmm. um, especially in certain eras especially when you have a lot of turmoil you will also have a lot of slanted accounts that get uh, propagated through the era and uh, through the times and get to you and it's still slanted so you you will benefit if you read the account of the same event from many different narrators that come from extremely different uh, uh, spots and positions on the spectrum um, and I will give an example uh, one of the figures that is going to appear soon in Without Moonlight is one of the leaders of uh, of uh, the Greek resistance. There were a couple of really big ones and a lot, several uh, uh, smaller ones because in Greece everyone wants to be a leader. Okay, it's a thing. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a thing that has been a curse and a blessing for Greece. Yes. Um, so this guy, my personal take, and I, I say it immediately from the get-go, I, I admire this man. I feel that he was an amazing personality, a tragic one also. But if you read accounts of him from extreme communists and extreme right-wingers, you get completely different accounts of who he was and what he was from all sorts of things. Like you get a, a ghastly mudslinging, like the, the mudslinging that we see today happening 
between, like, uh, for example, Republicans and Democrats is nothing in front of the mud slinging that was taking place at that time. Yeah. Well, yeah, because especially between communists and... I um, oh, sorry. absolutely love this guy. I love in the sense that I really appreciate and respect him. Um, I forced myself to read through slanderous um, and real malevolent things because I wanted to make sure that I had all the Andes uh, in my awareness and I knew everything that was being said. And some of the things are clearly unfounded, some others aren't. And I wouldn't know about them if I hadn't read these sources. So even if you hate it, and even if it's hard, uh, go ahead and read the, the other side's account, because uh, you will be far more in control of the objective truth, and you will be able to create something that will be more authentic and more people identify with it, regardless of what their approach to history is. So that's uh, my advice, if you like, it, it, about any era, not just you know, Greek or whatever. It does inform your world a lot better and allow you to go in different directions because you know, like, the, the feeling of the time and you know what, you know, people's sensibilities were. So in Pinky T, I've sort of done the same thing and that, you know, I wanted it to sort of be this whole... <sighs> Basically, what resulted in the First World War, First World War didn't happen in my world because this conflict takes place in the 1920s. So I had to read about all the causes and the politics of the First World War and so what led up to that. And so, you know, I did a bit of reading about all the different political intrigues between Germany and um, Britain and all those myriad countries that were involved in that. And it's basically 19th century empire building that led up to it. Everyone wanted mm -hmm. a big war. Everyone wanted some decisive conflict to work out who was on top, and so they've they've got that, and that's the sensibilities that are in influencing my work. It's based on the First mm -hmm. World War, based on the nineteenth century ideals about empires, and that was how people thought it was going to be. It wasn't like in the the nineteen forties. It's a completely different thing. It's all crises and new countries. But back then it was strikingly different. The world absolutely changed after the First World War. And so that's more what my stuff is based on. And I've been able to read, you know, about... So if you say, say you read the famous 19th century books like, um, you know, Anna Karenina or War and Peace, mm -hmm. or that kind of stuff. So that's going to inform you about the Russian personality, Russian ideals. Um, one of my favorite books is uh, Hero of Our Time, which is a more satirical mm -hmm. look at um, uh, what it was like to be a frontier officer in 19th century Russia. So again, that, that informs me, you know, people are very uh, s status oriented in that kind of mm -hmm. world. So that's how you, how you got to have it. So people are very, you know, um, okay, so I've got royal background or whatever, and that's going to help me move forward and, people in especially in russia are very uh concerned about duels and dueling and being insulted and all that kind of stuff so that's a that's a big thing so that informs it so the more you immerse yourself in those kind of cultural aspects the more it it sort of helps you inform your your um your world that you're creating and helps you get inside their heads and it helps you um, mm -hmm. create a more interesting world because you know more how people think so that, that that's a really helpful thing I don't know do you read a lot of like 19th century not not 19th century 1940s like fiction and things like that not just fact uh, yeah yeah actually um, a big a big part of uh, the atmosphere that exists in Without Moonlight comes from reading novels 
that were written either right after or basically right after because uh, at the time uh, we had the occupation so People basically were occupied during the... <laughs> yeah <laughs> we were a little busy so art was a bit uh, the standstill at the time pretty much like everything else if you if you look and this is like an aside if you look at the uh, output of uh, Greece as a, as a state as a country during the occupation it everything comes to an absolute drop and a stop everything stops for four or five years or so um, and then it, it jump starts again <laughs> it, it absolutely takes off um, so uh, I have read a lot of novels written by Greeks that lived through these times and they documented these times and they wrote about these times and there are a lot of short stories there are a lot of um, uh, novels that go very very much very deeply into the soul of a Greek person going through these times young old uh, pretty much every age there, there are novels and there are short stories there are vignettes that are going to inform you about how people felt at the time and um, uh, I absolutely recommend there are some there are some that have been translated into English and other and other uh, languages that are not as traumatic as some that I have read <laughs> that haven't been, uh, exist only in Greek, but uh, pretty much uh, very, very striking and they will not pull any punches, but then they will not also tear you apart. apart. Um, and uh, a lot of these stories were written by a very renowned, globally renowned Greek author called uh, Alkize, and I'm going to write her name here. If you if you find uh, she's supposedly a young adult author, don't let that categorization fool you. She is not. Mm. She is uh, she can be very heavy. Uh, she just has a, a casual turn of phase in a sense. Like she speaks very casually. She speaks. It, it, the narrator always feels very close to you. So that's yeah. why they. And, and the characters are often very young. So that's why she has been characterized often as a children's or young adult uh, author. But uh, she has uh, said that uh, often, that no, <laughs> it's not. Like it has young people in it, but it's not necessarily for young people because it um, the, the subject matter, even if um, she has uh, stories that don't take place during the war, still are very, very deeply affected and and um, signal back to the world. So if you if you want to feel to to have a feel of those eras, definitely look her up and her titles. Mm -hmm. And if you want uh, to see where without moonlight comes from. So the last thing I wanted to say about here is that if you want to really see where without moonlight's atmosphere comes from, uh, the title that you want is uh, Peter's Long Walk. And that's uh, that's uh, without moonlight, basically. Uh, okay, all right. That's without the adventure. It's uh, the it's the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> no adventure in that sense. Yeah, that kind of thing can really help. Um, getting the atmosphere right and yeah. a fiction writer is more helpful in that way than a biographer or you know a non-fiction writer because you know we're writing fiction so we need to get that kind of tone so that helps us uh, crystallize it better and they're not necessarily a fiction writer is not necessarily you know doing a whole thing that's made up there are people who, who know mm -hmm. the time, they've done the research or they've lived through it and they're able to do it. So it gives us a good kind of, you know, a pointer of how we can do mm -hmm. it. It's like um, 
someone who who does comics and you know they they've done a uh a caricature or a version of um uh like a famous figure or whatever and you know that that's caricatured and that's simplified and mm -hmm. us copying it is not going to be helpful but also us doing our own version and coming up with our own simplified version from you know realistic photos is just reinventing the wheel so it's better to look at how they've done it as well as looking at the, the original photos and then coming out with our version so okay maybe... so i looked up the book yeah it has a different title in english it it is a petros's uh, war and this is the book so if anyone wants to pick it up there you go okay. and it says for teenagers and young readers huh? don't gift it to young reader not like this <laughs> <laughs> I will share that as the link. All right. I like the actual, uh, the the other title, your translation, Peter's Long Walk. That's really cool. Yeah, that's uh, the Greek uh, title. Ah. Uh, the direct translation of the, of the Greek uh, title. Because the whole point of the, the, the whole uh, story is that uh, Peter, Petros, in, in, in English, in Greek, his name is Petros. Um, he has to go from point A to point B and back again. And and then through his eyes, you see everything that is happening in Athens. So, <laughs> uh, I was just uh, amused by it's. It's got the French title there, and the French title is "The War of Petros." Yes, so, <laughs> we have three versions of the title. Yeah, I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, but it, it's amazing. It's an amazing book, but I wouldn't, uh, unless uh, you have a very precocious kid that wants to learn about uh, the grimness of uh, what it is to live in an occupied country, don't buy it for a young kid. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh... I don't know. Well, maybe maybe that is helpful because there are people who are in occupied situations and it's helpful for them to learn what those people mm -hmm. are experiencing. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. It does lend you a very interesting perspective on the whole, um, yeah, being in a war torn country, which is more valuable now than ever because we're, we're doing that to the poor people in um, Afghanistan and Iraq mm -hmm. and Syria, and <laughs> we want to do it to poor old Iran. And <laughs> mm -hmm. learn from history, people. Don't impose that on others. Read novels of the time, and definitely get yourself immersed first in uh, the historical era you are trying to recreate before you you go about um, telling your story in it. That's exactly it. Yeah, get yourself immersed in it. So you've got a better idea. So then you can create your pastiche. That's going to be my word of this quack cast, pastiche. <laughs> pastiche. <laughs> then you can I like create it. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and there is also another thing that I would like to add in the sense that uh, you are a creature of your own era and... You have to be aware of that. Uh, you don't live in the era that you want to depict. And so you have to be aware how, where you and your personality, not personality, your, um, your experience and your approach to the world that is current ends and where the one that you want to create and recreate from that era begins. Yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna get uh, gods of Egypt, and <laughs> you're gonna get <laughs> you're gonna get Hercules, and yeah. and taverns, yeah. and uh, not taverns, uh, restaurants when they didn't exist, <laughs> and waiters when they didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, yeah, restaurants and stuff are very nineteenth century kind of uh, thing, or maybe eighteenth century. 
19th century, yeah, yeah. didn't really exist before then in the form we think of now and we impose that on history so in the everyone's always got yeah proper ins and all that kind of stuff um, which is uh, not the case no no it's incredibly awkward that's actually a good point you know your your whole immersing um yourself in the in the current world yeah because your your uh view of the world uh diverges from the whole world that, that people had in the past. That is a very, very good notion. I was thinking of some uh, great animes that do the whole historical pastiche and alternative world. Because that, that's what, you know, Pinky TA does. It does it in a very anime kind of way, a very manga, I suppose, kind of way. Mm -hmm. There's been a few recent animes, and one of them that comes to mind is Tanya of the Evil, or Evil Tanya, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And in this version of the world, this horrible man is sent into an alternative uh, version of the world, and he's sent back to um, Germany during the First World War. But this is a Germany, this is a world where magic exists, and he's sent back mm -hmm. and into the body of a young girl. And, you know, he, he grows up as, as a very young girl, who has magical power and this uh this germany where she's growing up is at war in you know involved in the first world war with magic and so she becomes a child soldier and she knows how you know the whole germany fared in the in the real world and so she's you know thinking oh my god i'm in this this i can't get out how and I've got magic power. How am I going to make the best of this in this world? And she becomes this uh, demon soldier. And she uses her, her power to try and make uh, Germany win the First World War in this, in this kind of a world. And so this is an alternative history, you know, with magic set in the First World War. And these people have, you know, the creators have used their, their knowledge of the First World War and the way Germans think and you know all that kind of stuff to inform this world and create this uh this alternative world and it's really interesting because it diverges so much from our real world but it takes so much from our real world to to create so yeah that, that's fascinating a lot of anime absolutely does that. yeah absolutely and and there's another thing like i have always been very much enamored with that notion and, and having people uh, diverge from history as we know it with little things that may or like that if they actually had happened would have completely derailed history as we know it and given completely different outcomes, not necessarily uh, worse outcomes than what we got. So um um, I've always been thinking, like, for example, Greece lost a huge opportunity towards the end of the occupation. We had huge opportunity to not create a republic, but create a democracy. And I'm, I'm talking about an actual democracy, not a communist uh, Soviet thing. Mm -hmm which was the, the other the other bid. We were between a rock and a hard place, like, a, will it be Soviet under Russia? Will it be a republic under, uh, you know, the Allies and everybody else, and it was the West? But we had this sliver, this small opportunity, an open window of a chance to be neither, to be something completely different and, and something that potentially would be able to be its own thing and and of course it was lost yeah. because the people that could do it got assassinated but what if they weren't what if they were just lucky enough to dodge the damn bullet and okay. it would be an amazing thing to do and and actually i was very much tempted when i was creating without moonlight to after like after we get 
when we get to that point to diverge history and create yeah. something different. I'm not going to do it, but I always, like I do that exercise. I do that mental exercise in my mind. Like what would have been, what would have been the thing if, <laughs> if that had happened, if, if uh, we had uh, the a, a referendum when we should have had it and it wasn't canceled, if people hadn't given up arms when they did uh, as they shouldn't have and blah, 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 this sort of thing. Well, um, you'd have Mecca and Pinky T.I. world. <laughs> yes. And, and people would go around uh, in uh, bottomless pants or clothesless pants or something like that. Precisely. It's what it leads to <laughs> freedom and democracy and suddenly that's what ends. <laughs> it's exactly. <ideal. laughs> oh, God. But uh, it does make for for great opportunities for storytelling. I might at some point, when I feel a little bit more skilled perhaps, I might make a, a short comic, like a short story comic with an alternate reality. And what would, what would the outcome be if we had this instead of that? It's, I think it's definitely worth it as, as an exercise. And it's, it's just fun. Because mm -hmm. the, when you create an idealized world, you're not creating Mary Sue world because no. there's no fun, but you're using that as inspiration to create something interesting. And then you, you know, you introduce conflict and, you know, you introduce the bad sides or whatever, and it allows you to, to explore this kind of world. Because, um, you know, you, like you say, okay, what, what happened what would happen if, you know, we had this sliver and we had this great democracy, but then you also think, okay, so what would be the neg what would be the conflict? What would be the bad things that happen? And that exactly. allows you to give exactly. even further and, and into it. Maybe the communists are, you know, wanting to change it. Maybe the Republicans are wanting to, mm -hmm. you know, their holdouts and they're plotting against. Oh, definitely, you know. definitely. Maybe we would have, uh, um, other forces that you have indication, historical indication, uh, that they were willing to do certain things. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. if anyone uh, looks up uh, uh, General Scobie, I uh, will know what I'm talking about. Um, th what would uh, they do when they felt that they were losing their influence in the particular area? And, and how would that work? Exactly. So it wouldn't be all fun and games. For sure. How, um, how would this, you know, the Allies uh, deal with this, you know, the Americans and mm -hmm. the British, especially the British were terrible in so many ways. How are they going to cope with this? They're going to destabilize things? Are they going to make deals? What's going to happen? So, yeah. yeah. Are they going to vilify it, which was a very beloved uh, British tactic about <laughs> a lot of things? Not only British, to be. Uh, objective. A lot of uh, propaganda in invests in that sort of thing. So it's not just them. Yeah. But they were very, very good at it. <laughs> they were extremely good at it. Yeah, um, it could be like a situation in um, like Lebanon, part of the mm -hmm. proxy war of um, between the East and West. So yeah, yeah or or uh, or Pakistan. What happened with Pakistan? It's another thing. Um, exactly. Which brings us back to the fact that even if you want to create an alternate reality, in order for it to be worth it, in the sense that people will take it seriously, you will have a suspension of disbelief. If I'm to quote a, a recent, relatively recent uh, quack chat that we had, uh, quack cast, mm -hmm. sorry. The quack chat is in Twitter. Be in Twitter, people. Um, um, you need to know what actually happened. You need to have a good grasp of the era that you want to uh, to manipulate, and yeah. that will it's tedious at first, but it will make it a lot more fun for you, if nothing else. Uh, when you are in a position to manipulate the facts and you are in a position to, 
to imagine what would have happened and how things would have evolved beyond this. Because you will have the experience of how things evolve in a geopolitical world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm now ranting, sorry, not ranting, the rambling as I work in my historical comic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it all makes sense, but we, we should sort of maybe cut it off now because we're a bit over time. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope people get something out of this. It was a fun talk. It was, it was. I'm probably overly excited <laughs> talking about things. There's oh, so yeah. much to it, and we could keep on going into different aspects of stuff like that and bring up different oh, yeah, yeah. world stuff. And oh my God, it's, it's everything. So this has been Quackhouse number 387. I've been Ozone Ocean and you've been the fantastic Tans. <laughs> yeah, Tansery. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.